this seems like big news to me. So first, let me just do a gut check with both of you. I'll start with you, Harry, and go to Mary. Uh, is it big news? Yeah, it's big news. Uh, and, you know, it's preceded by a few months of negotiation with Pence's team where he was jockeying perhaps for a voluntary interview, not doing it under oath. And Jack Smith, you know, this sort of thing happened with Mueller, the January 6th committee. Jack Smith pulls the trigger. Now, well, I'll see you at the grand jury, enough sort of pussyfooting around on this. Pence has really critical information. He's probably framed the subpoena to maximize his legal chances, and that means stuff that you can't get from anyone else. That's first and foremost the one-on-one -on -one conversations on the phone and one in the wing of the Oval Office where Trump does a merciless and profane uh, pressure campaign to get him to break the law. Mary, what do you think? Well, just going to that last point that Harry made, you know, it's my understanding that that merciless uh, pressure campaign, that last call at around 1130 on January 6th, is one that the vice president took alone without an aide there. And so that means there is no one else who can supply to Jack Smith uh, evidence of what the president said and what um, uh, Vice President Pence said back to the president at the time. Now, we have seen some clips from the President Trump's side of that call, but they were not complete. And so that is, I think, some critical testimony. And ultimately, if this is challenged on um, executive privilege grounds, which we can talk about, of course, in more detail, it, it will come down to could this be obtained anywhere else? And I think there are some things that only the former vice president can provide. Let's follow up on that, because that becomes the next question, right? So. Uh, Vice President Pence, his his stated what he said about a subpoena from the January 6th committee was he would not cooperate, that he doesn't owe them his testimony. And he just said flatly no. Now, that wasn't litigated. It was just instead withdrawn before the committee uh, closed up shop. So that just didn't go anywhere. This is a different thing. You get subpoenaed. You have to comply with that subpoena um, unless you have some case for why you don't. What would be the avenue, Mary, I'll start with you, by which Theoretically, the, 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 the ex vice president could challenge the subpoena. Well, I suspect that uh, either the vice president on his own or at the wishes of the former president will assert executive privilege. Um, and, you know, there's a number of different things to then consider. So first is the is whether a former president can even exert executive privilege. Now, the Supreme Court has never definitively resolved that, but they've come pretty close. And most recently, about a year ago, almost exactly in the case of Trump v. Thompson, this was a case where the House Select Committee, of course, had subpoenaed presidential records from the archivist. Former President Trump asserted executive privilege. Current President Biden said, I'm not going to assert it. And this case went through the courts and um, uh, the lower courts held that there, the that President Trump's assertion of executive privilege would not be maintained right. uh, in the face of that. But the but Justice Kavanaugh in, you know, the Supreme Court declined to intervene there. They did not take this case up. But Justice Kavanaugh left open the door that even a former president could assert executive privilege. Now, he said it might be a diminished right to executive privilege because Executive privilege is about uh, protecting the communications between the president and his highest aides so that they can speak to him with candor without worrying about those communications becoming public. And what Justice Kavanaugh said and what has been said in other cases is that that need for candor can extend even beyond a presidency. However, it might be reduced. And even when there is a sitting president, such as the case of President Nixon back during the Watergate scandal, even during when, a, when there's a sitting president who asserts executive privilege in a criminal investigation, that can yield to a demonstrated specific need. Right. And that's what we're talking about with uh, even if we apply that standard, I think that um, Jack Smith probably has the better of the argument here, at least for some aspects of the, the former vice president's testimony. There's also the complicating factor, and maybe it isn't, but I'm just, I'm not making a legal point here so much as just a sort of intuitive common sense one. But it just does seem a little hard to write a seven-figure book contract book in which you disclose details about the supposedly privileged communication. You write an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying, called My Last Days with Donald Trump, and then tell the government that the substance of the things that you wrote a multi-million dollar book about are privileged. Or does that not... Does that not matter, Harry? 
Yeah, it probably does. They call it waiver, but it's almost beside the point. Everything Mary says about the law is spot on, but let me just cut to the chase. He's going to lose this if he brings the claim. Nixon is just completely on point. Whatever rights a vice president have, they can't be greater than a president, and if there's a demonstrated need, and that's why we were both suggesting he has tailored his request probably carefully to get at what he can't otherwise get, he is going to lose. And there's a strategic question for him. He wants to announce for president. If he, if he makes this challenge now, it will hover over him maybe in eight months or whatever when it when it's played yeah. out and he loses it will have been the thing that impaired his uh, announcement all this time there's a possibility even though i know the reports are this will spark a executive privilege claim there's a possibility that he will now say have you know now that he's looked like he's forced and there's a the gun of a subpoena at his head that he may comply now and for political reasons and Pence thinks about those things, uh, it's probably a smarter move. That, that timing question is an interesting one. I hadn't considered that in terms of where you want this to end up uh, on the calendar, considering the other things uh, he, he is considering. I, I guess I also wonder, Mary, and I, I don't know if there's any way to know this, so you can tell me, look, we just don't know, but what the timing here means about whatever decision making is working its way through that office, right? Like when you sub subpoena the, the ex vice president's a big deal, obviously. I'm not sure it's ever happened before. <laughs> um, so when you do that, what's it mean, as best we can tell from the outside, Mary, about where this might be in the timeline that they're dealing with? Yeah, and you know, I always hate to speculate on the timeline of these things, but it, there's no question that they would have tried other means to get the information they are now seeking for a couple of reasons. One, because they know this is going to be a big deal. It's going to make the press. Here we are talking about it. Right. It's going to, you know, it's going to, you know, potentially engender litigation. And I would just note, even if the vice president wants to cooperate, I wouldn't put it past former President Trump filing his own litigation because he's done that before. So yep. put, but putting that aside on the timing. So the, the Department of Justice, through the special counsel, will want to have established a record so that they can say to the court, we tried everything else and we have a demonstrated specific need. That doesn't mean it's the last thing they're going to do, but it does me say to me they've they've tried to get at this information through other means. They're ready to talk to the vice president. And, you know, they still may have many other steps to go and they to take and they and they may learn things from Vice President Prince if they do end up talking to him that will then lead to additional investigative steps. But, you know, they're they're fairly far along in the process, yeah. I would say, where they wouldn't be taking this step. Well, and there's also the fact that. That, that, that strikes me, Harry, uh, it, the same question you, but also the fact that there's only a small universe of other possible targets of the investigation his testimony could pertain to, right? I mean, a, he's there in the room at one point, I think, with John Eastman, um, and, and there's reason to believe that John Eastman might have criminal exposure, but really it's about he's the guy who can testify to, to what Trump said and to his state of mind and to the fact that he was told by his lawyers is not illegal. So it does also seem... Like, Trump is squarely in the focus of anything you want to get out of Vice President Mike Pence. 100 percent. Other people can give the Eastman stuff. He can uniquely give stuff about Trump. So that really uh, has to be has to be the case. And, and, and in terms of Mary's surmise, I share it. It's that that would be big news if true. Right. Because we've been assuming they're really far along on Mar-a-Lago, not so much on January 6th. But I got to agree, every prosecutory instinct in me says, whatever you do, you don't do this till you're fairly well yeah. along. You don't want to do it twice, that's for sure. And uh, it does suggest, even though it contradicts the best evidence we've had to date, that, that Smith is far along, not just in Mar-a-Lago, but January 6th as well. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I guess my final point here would be that whatever precedent is, particularly vis-a-vis -vis privilege and Nixon, one of the things we've learned is that uh, you know, that and $3 gets you on the subway. What matters is if you can count to five at the court. And my strong suspicion is, uh, for, for all the projects that the conservatives on that court have, bailing out Donald Trump isn't particularly one that I think you can count to five on. We'll see. But I don't think he has the votes there. Mary McCord and Harry Lippman. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Tonight's breaking news that former Vice President Mike Pence has been subpoenaed by the special counsel investigating January 6th has potentially far-reaching legal implications for ex-president Donald Trump, of course, but also carries serious political implications considering 
The special counsel investigation is now heating up just a year before the presidential primaries get underway. It was almost exactly one year ago that Pence first drew a clear line between him and his former boss over the insurrection, and at the same time indicated he might be a candidate himself in 2024. I heard this week that President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump is wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. And frankly, there is no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. Under the Constitution, I had no right to change the outcome of our election. And Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. David Friedlander is a journalist who reported today in Political Magazine about how the GOP is starting to plot against Donald Trump. Mona Sharon is a nationally syndicated columnist, policy editor of The Bulwark, and both join me now. Mona, let me start with you just about the political ramifications here. I mean, Pence is <laughs> walking this really, truly, almost comically difficult tightrope, right? He wants the, the guy, he wanted his mob to lynch me. I loved everything we did together until that part, which I'm not a fan of, but we'll agree to disagree on whether I should have been lynched. And, uh, and I, but I won't cooperate with the January 6th committee, but now I've been subpoenaed. It, it, it seems largely impossible, but I do wonder what the political implications are here at, at your first blush. Well, I mean, it's impossible to to try to grasp how Pence wraps his brain on this particular axle, you know, <laughs> um, as you say, you know, I, yes, he tried to kill me. But, you know, friends have their disagreements, right. I think, is something along <laughs> right, the lines yeah. of what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, look, he is desperate for support. He wants to be president himself. Uh, which is the disease that afflicts so many. And uh, and so he's he's going to try to walk, as you say, this tightrope. But look, um, I, I also believe that despite his having no spine, that there are some lines that Pence won't cross, as he yes. demonstrated on January 6th. And I think one of them is probably he's not going to lie to the independent counsel. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. The, yes. as your previous guests were saying, I mean, there may be delays. There may be court cases about whether he indeed needs to do this, but eventually he's going to have to. Yeah. And at that time, I do not think he will lie. I think he'll tell the truth. Well, um, and uh, and that's not not good for for Donald Trump. Right. I agree with that. I also think I, I think that's true. I was a little boxed in because he wrote a book about it. I mean, it's, a, it's like, you know, that you could say, like, I don't remember, you know, it was a long time ago. But like when you've written a book in which you recounted one of the key conversations, you know, you got a little less wiggle room yeah. in, ter in, in terms of that. There's also so you wrote this great piece about what donor world is doing. So so tell me first a little bit about your reporting. And I want to ask you about how this plays into it, because I think. Honestly, the thing that looms over the year 2023 in all of Republican politics and then all of presidential politics is, is Donald Trump going to get indicted? And if so, what's that mean? What are big Republican donors doing to try to stop Donald Trump from being the nominee? Well, these are folks who are like, I wouldn't call them like anti-Trump wing of the party, but the no. kind of non-Trump wing of the party. Like they are concerned about Republicans winning, Republicans holding. That's what they care about. Yeah. They think he's going to lose. Right. And, and that's, that's their thing. I mean, you know, if he were the nominee, they'd probably support him, regardless of what they say now. Ultimately, yeah. if it's him and Joe Biden or, or whomever, they probably support him. So they're worried about that eventuality and what can be done to sort of prevent a, what they see as a very flawed nominee, uh, you know, from winning the nomination. So then the question becomes like, they're, they're trying to kind of do a little bit of like money access control to keep the field narrow, mm -hmm. right? But I do wonder, like, to the extent that Trump is either indicted or it looks like he's going to like, they're going to have a harder time doing the field narrowing, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. if people think, oh, well, maybe he'll be in jail. Right. Well, somebody pointed out to me, which I thought was, was, was very smart, actually, it's like the weaker Trump looks, yes. that just means you have more Republicans yes. winning, entering the, the race. You have more Republicans entering the race, it means more likely that Trump wins because he has whatever it is, 30 or 40 percent yep. of the vote, solid. So if there's like a two or three person race, maybe they can defeat Trump. If it's a six, eight, nine person race, 
he's got an advantage. Right. And that's that, of course, is exactly the sort of perverse collective action problem that they face, that they're trying to kind of wall people off by being like, you're not going to get money. <laughs> right. We'll tell you. Right. 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 I mean, you got a quote in there of like, we'll tell you if you can run. Right. Like, <laughs> no, it's sort of like this. It's like, go ahead. Feel free to run. Have a great time. Do everything you got to do. Come January, when Iowa caucus this New Hampshire primary, if, you're, if it's not happening for you, it's time to pull the plug. This pig is getting turned off. Yeah. Then, so the, the big question here, Mona, and this is a question for everyone. It's a question for, honestly, it's a question for Jack Smith and Merrick Garland. It's a question for all of small-D Democratic politics in the country, right? Which is, what a possible indictment, which were it to happen, would do to his political standing? I think that, you know, if I had to place a bet, uh, it would... It would increase it in the short term in the Republican Party. But I'm not sure that that would last necessarily. But I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think this is actually hard to hard to gauge, because if you recall, uh, after the um, uh, investigation or they called it a raid on Mar-a-Lago yeah, the search, after yeah. they uh, executed the search, um, you know, there was a tremendous rallying around Trump. Because he has he has inculcated in Republicans a real taste for victimhood, and and so if he can then be the victim in chief again, that might be the one thing that would make them rally around him. I mean, he is he's leeching support right now. Yeah. Um, but if he can, it's I, I can't rule out the possibility that if he's indicted, he can play up this, you know, I'm being persecuted by the deep state business and uh, and cause a certain rebound. I don't know. Yeah. And that is the nightmare scenario for the folks that you were mm -hmm. reporting on, because, again, their objection here is purely a matter of winning. Right. Like he lost to Joe Biden. He was clearly associated with candidates who underperformed by four or five points in the midterms. Yeah. It clearly cost them, I think, winnable seats, sure. right? They just want to win. Yeah. So the worst case scenario for them is a situation in which his standing with swing voters or the general electorate yeah. declines even more because he's indicted. Right. But increases with the primary electorate. Right. I mean, that's a situation it seems like we had the last couple of years, right? And, and like, that's their thing. They, they are, some of them are just furious with him. I mean, they're shaking with anger, in, in part because not only did he. Boy, like, tough. He, I mean, I he, feel not, so bad for them. How'd like, they end up here? <laughs> Poor guys. But Bummer. I mean, what, what they're angry about is also that he, not only did he endorse all these losers in the midterms, but he kept all this money. He's just sitting on a pile yeah. of money that he's raising and not yeah. spending. Um, it's almost like he is a con artist. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, jeez! I wish there was like a fable mm. about an animal that like took in someone yeah. took in a snake and then it, figured know. out that the snake would bite them. Yeah, try that on stage. <laughs> I think I've heard about it. Yes. Well, I, I mean, the other thing here is there. There seems to be some. Let's show that uh, that bit from the Times article. There does seem to be a little bit of also there. So there's a strange thing that's happening too, right? Because that the um, th there's been a back and forth here. Uh, that lawyers of the department's national security division have been discussing in detail a possible agreement to search Pence's house in Indiana for additional governor documents on a parallel track that's on the classified stuff, because they've now got two tracks going, and that Pence's advisors were incensed by disclosure of a pending search last week, blamed the department for leaking details to pressure them. So there's also this, like, back and forth with DOJ and FBI on this other classified documents track, Mona. I, I don't know what that amounts to in terms of the in terms of the Pence Sorry. people, no, it's fine. That seems like a nice, <laughs> nice, is that a dog back there? seems like a nice dog. Um, yeah, it's a dog. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it, but it, it does seem like there's, there's some tension between them and DOJ, and, and this, th they're now going to have to figure out what their next move is, right? And that's going to be a legal decision, but it's also going to be a political one, as Harry Lippman was saying in the last block. Right. Um, if you don't mind, could I just go back to the earlier point about Please. the money, though, real quick? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because... Um, because David Friedlander's piece is excellent, but it re it's sort of giving me a little bit of PTSD as I think back to 2016, because um, what it requires is so much coordination and collective action on the part of these donors. Yeah. First of all, let's remember, Trump, the money is irrelevant to him. He has all the money he can possibly he can want, as was just mentioned. Yes. It's irrelevant. It's whether they have pressure on other candidates. And in order to be able to effectively pressure other candidates, they have to all work in unison. 
How many donors are there? There are hundreds yeah. of them that are that are tremendously wealthy. Are they all going to come to some sort of agreement in a back room? Okay, it's going to be this guy or yeah. this gal and not the others. And this is the date on which everyone has to put their cards on the table or, or get out. I'm very skeptical that that kind of yeah. coordination is remotely possible. Yeah, well, that's one of the big questions uh, as we enter. There's a lot of questions, a lot of open questions about the next like six yeah. months, particularly. But what, what, what this is all going to look like as we head into like the real, real season mm -hmm. after Labor Day of this year, I have, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. He could be he could be facing charges or not, or he could be the front runner. Who knows? David Freelander, owner chair. Thank you both.